Good morning. It's good to see your face. <laughs> um, so, <clears throat> Father Higgins has the mass, and um, for those who have uh, not been here during the week, right now we're going to be doing confessions through these front doors instead of the confessional, since there's more space, and um, on my side we'll have the um, doors are open, or we can sit outside, so I'll be offering confessions during mass for anybody who would like that. singing our opening hymn, number 476, There's a Wideness in God's Mercy, number 476, Please Stand.
Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. 
Who ever loved son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Whoever receives you receives me. And whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. Whoever receives a prophet, because he is a prophet, will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever receives a righteous man, because he is a righteous man, will receive a righteous man's reward. And whoever gives a cup of cold water to one of these little ones to drink, because the little one is a disciple, Amen, I say to you, he will surely not lose his reward. The Gospel of the Lord. Good morning, everyone. Warm, warm welcome back. So good to be with you. We promise we'll never take you for granted again. You know, our hearts are full. Thanks for coming out. So many of you, honestly, I personally wasn't expecting so many of you to come. Thank you so much for, for taking the risk. You know, we have a dispensation. We're not obliged to come. But you've come because you're hungry. Me too. You know, it's so many blessings this weekend, this past Friday. Our seminarian from last summer, you'll remember, a Deacon... Well, he was just Luis Silva last summer. After that, he was Deacon Luis Silva, and Friday became Father Luis Silva. He was ordained in a socially distant ordination at St. Patrick's Cathedral. And what a great, uh, what a great blessing. You know, it's in that context of, of his decision to leave everything. Remember when he was here, he talked about how he... He gave his like personal testimony. He said he was going to go to... He took time off from the seminary. He was going to go to Mexico and find a senorita and get married and live happily ever after. But God's call was relentless in him. And it's easy for me to see these readings in that, in that context where he says, whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. Jesus is very demanding. That made me think also of um, of a friend of mine from the seminary, one of my classmates from the Midwest. Um, his story is, is was difficult. His trip to the priesthood. Uh, he grew up in a, a non-Catholic family, a nominally Protestant family in the Midwest. But he had met friends in his teenage years, in his college years, that introduced him to, to Catholic Christianity, and he was moved by it. When, when he felt in himself that he couldn't resist it anymore, he, uh, he had to tell the news to his mother and father. They were not happy. They were quite displeased, actually. Because, you know, he grew up in a family, maybe they went two, three times a year to church. And Catholics, for them, he, they call them cookie worshippers. You could see why, because of our belief in Christ's presence in the Holy Eucharist. But then, um, when, when he told them that he was going to enter the church because he had become convinced of, of the truth and wanted to do it, even though... You know, there was a part of him that held back. He thought, when he was going through the RCA process, he asked himself, can I, can I really commit to going to Mass every Sunday? And when he realized he had to move forward, he, he went to Mass every day after that, up to today, no doubt. 
But eventually, as parents, whatever makes you happy, we're not going to oppose you. And he continued uh, in his faith until he felt deep inside of him the call to, to become a priest. And he entered the seminary. Before that, he was with even greater trepidation to tell this to, to his, his parents. He thought, maybe if I, if I do it separately, it'll be better. Um, so he was going to tell his mom first. She, when he told her that he was going to become a priest, she erupted in tears. She buried her face in her hands and said, why? 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 She just couldn't understand it. That was a hard conversation for both of them. But for me, it's a, it's a sign of what Christ was. Christ's discipleship can sometimes call us to. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. My buddy Doug realized that. And Jesus is calling his disciples to understand the real cost of discipleship. And you'd almost get the feeling that he's trying to thin out the crowd. That he's trying to raise the bar so high that people would just give up and stop following him. But truly, he wants us to follow him. He just wants us to realize and to purify our love for him. Maybe from being distant followers to being real disciples. Because it is possible perhaps theoretically, to be a distant follower of Jesus instead of a real disciple. It's like someone who likes to follow fire trucks around but doesn't really want to put out any fires. Someone wants to hang on to a great cause without pulling one's weight in it. And Jesus is clear enough that he's, he wants something more than halfway disciples. And he's saying that to be his disciples, one has to love him more than anything else. Or more than anyone else. No human attachment can stand between us and him if we're truly going to be his disciples. Not even our parents. You know, some years back I heard a priest say that it's one of the supreme handicaps of the church there are so many distant followers and so few real disciples of the Lord. Maybe I can make it a little bit more concrete on how to live that out. You know, in my room from the rectory, I can look out and I can see two beautiful bridges. I could see the Whitestone Bridge closer and then a little bit farther away I could see the Throgsneck Bridge, these beautiful structures. When the engineers designed it, like when they design any bridge, they have to prepare the structure and the material so, it's, so that it's strong enough to bear three different kinds of loads. It has to bear the dead load, the live load, and the wind load. The, the dead load is the strength that the structure of the bridge has to have to sustain its very own weight. All that concrete and metal has to be sustained, and the, the bridge has to be designed in such a way to hold it up. But not just the dead load, it has to be able to sustain the live load, not only itself, but all that traffic, those massive trucks and other vehicles that pass over it. And even that is not enough, because when, when a bridge is that height and that size, it's going to be subject to winds and on certain occasions extreme winds and it still has to bear all that weight. Something similar is true with our own discipleship of the Lord Jesus. We have to be able to withstand the dead load, the live load, and the wind load. Let me explain. The dead load. That's me. I'm the dead wood that first we have to be able to carry the dead wood of our own selves. 
our own weaknesses, our own tendency to sin and give in easily to temptation. You know, we've been through this pandemic and we're just starting to come out. I know we have a long way to go. And I don't know if you're like me, but this pandemic has, has brought so clearly to my awareness so many weaknesses inside myself, so many tendencies to not do the right thing, um, to cave into laziness and uh, self-absorption, whatever the weakness is. In a real way, when Jesus says that we have to deny ourselves and take up our cross, it's that dead load of my own sinfulness, my own tendency I have to overcome. And so the Lord's inviting us to deny uh, our love for pleasure, our demanding of our own rights, and uh, any kind of sinful tendency we, we can discern in ourselves. So I love what my uncle used to describe chastity. He, he would say that chastity, you know, that's purity with our bodies. He said that's a love for Christ that's greater than our love for ourselves. If we love ourselves more than we love Jesus, we're going to fall into sins of the flesh. And uh, it's just two clicks away on our phone. But if we love Jesus more than we love ourselves, we'll be able to resist those temptations of the flesh and put it aside and overcome the dead load. But there's more. There's the live load. We have to be able to carry out the stuff that's put on our shoulders to live out in our daily duties of each day. You know, and, and so often our lives are filled with humdrum things. That following Jesus means we, we have to complete what he's put on our plate to do. Maybe he's made us to take care of people that we never signed on to take care of. That's part of the live load. Or the, the regular things that fall to us, our work, our school, our household tasks, the small things we could do in our home to make life better for the people we live with and pleasant. To love Jesus means to accept our daily responsibilities and tasks and perform them lovingly for others and in some way, all of them, for him, not begrudgingly, but cheerfully. And then discover that the live load is a pathway to great holiness. Ordinary things of life can be the gateway to great, great holiness. Like Mother Teresa said, it's not so much what you do that matters, it's the love that you put into the doing. And that way we can sanctify very ordinary tasks in our lives. You know, I was thinking of this when one little detail from the Lord's resurrection, we didn't really get to celebrate Easter this year. Or at least not in a, in a communal way like this. That was hard. But one detail stood out with the, the Lord's resurrection. Remember when John, the beloved disciple, runs there but he waits for Peter. Peter looks in and is puzzled. But John looked in and he saw and believed. He saw and believed. And I, I think what triggered his belief is what he saw there because it specifically says that he saw the burial cloth there in one part and the cloth that was used to wrap his head folded in another area. And that's what made him understand that Jesus was alive. Could it be as simple as, you know, that's always how he folded his pillowcase. I recognize it. You know, where you see the presence of the Blessed Mother who taught him how to fold his pillowcase, present even on the resurrection morning. But think of that in another way. You know, here is the Son of God in the flesh who was brutally mur murdered, liberated all the souls that were captive, in when he descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again, reconstituting the entire universe in his resurrection. 
And what's the first thing he does? He folds up his, oh, I gotta make sure this is nice and full. I don't wanna leave it in a ball in the corner. I gotta fold it up nice. Isn't that beautiful? To understand how simple things are part of the live load. And no one is more alive than Jesus. The third load is the wind load. That's the load that that sometimes fall to us when the storms blow and the emergencies and crises of life. Sometimes they're few and far between. And they are often for us a chance to prove our heroic virtue and our love for Jesus more than anything else. Many of us have experienced death of those who are close to us right now in this pandemic. You know, I was just reviewing the list of those for whom we need to have memorial masses because they couldn't have a funeral. There's 60 individuals on that list. And slowly but surely we'll get back when things get back to normal to have those memorial masses for them. And I mean, we're just coming out of this pandemic. We've learned a lot about ourselves and how, what is our capacity to handle a crisis. And, um, when these times come, there are a way we can really prove our love for Jesus. In all of these loads, there are a call for us to put Jesus ahead of ourselves. And we only begin to find life when we become true and close followers. All or nothing disciples of the Lord Jesus. Let me close with this footnote, you know. You never saw prouder parents. Fast forward a few years when I went out to the Midwest, Nebraska for my buddy's ordination. He was ordained two weeks after me. And you wouldn't see prouder parents, except for maybe my own, than when my buddy Father Doug walked down that aisle to receive the grace of ordination. And if I could find, add one more footnote. When just a couple years ago, my buddy's Doug mom, his mom was coming to the end of her life. She just had maybe a day or two left. He said, Mom, would you like to, to become a Catholic? So I could give you your first Holy Communion and a Catholic Mass for your funeral. She said, yes, I'd like that. She entered the church, and she died the next day and went to heaven. And it proves what Jesus says. Whoever lo finds his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Thanks for a minute.
singing our offertory hymn, Prayer of St. Francis.
them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you. Resurrection and ascension into heaven. And as we look forward to 
Savior's command and form by divine king, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day. reception brothers and sisters remember of three stations on the two sides as well as in the middle and we'll ask you to just to make sure we keep that distance between each person thank you so much okay.
this divine sacrifice we have offered and received, fill us with life, O Lord. We pray so that bound to you in lasting charity we may bear fruit that lasts forever through Christ our Lord. Just a, a moment, just a, a few practical announcements. So thank you for complying. It's always a little bit glitchy when you first start, but this allows us to uh, just work out the kinks after a couple weeks. Thanks for realizing we're all coming in on this door. We purposely left those doors open so you could come right in and, and take your seat um, without obstruction, not touching the knob. So the diocese asked us for the way out that that all the doors will be open. So we're principally going to leave through three exits. Our ushers will make sure that that exit over there is open, that exit there in the middle is going to be open, that exit over there is going to be open, maintaining social distancing as you leave. If we all went out of one exit, we'd all be cramped up, and we're still trying to keep that six-foot distance from each other, despite the love and closeness we feel for each other. Um, so we'll work out a few more of the kinks for next week as well. Next week also, you'll meet seminarian Stephen Gonzalez. Uh, he's going to be with us this summer for several weeks, just like Luis Silva was with us last summer, Father Luis Silva. Uh, Stephen Gonzalez will be with us this summer. He'll be, please God, next summer, Father Stephen Gonzalez. And uh, we're so blessed to have him, a wonderful young man. Uh, he's not with us today because of the first mass preparations, and uh, one of his classmates is being ordained a deacon today. So uh, that's this morning. Otherwise, he would be with us because he arrived on Monday. And just the good news, if you, if you find someone in this category going into kindergarten, uh, about 10 scholarships, not complete, but partial, but significant scholarships have been av made available to incoming kindergartners into Holy Cross School. So if you know someone in that category, just give a call to the school. It's a great opportunity to get, and it's not just for this year, it can last all the way through uh, nine years of Catholic education. Take advantage of that opportunity. Um, and uh, you could call the school for more information. So just to maybe close out with saying this, and, and Father Vincent, in, in my own name, of course, our beloved deacons, Deacon Luis Torres and Deacon Jaime Bello, we want to welcome you back. How good it is to have you back. We missed you. Uh, thank you for... Uh, you know, your faith over these three and a half months has sustained us as priests. I can, I can assure you of it. And, and we're grateful for those many expressions of, of gratitude that you, you poured out on us. You poured into your priests over these times through Facebook and emails and through your calls and through different ways whenever we happen to bump into your participation in our special events, uh, our, our social media events, just want to uh, express our deep love for you, the fact that we missed you so much and how glad we are to have you back. And I guess we can please stand for our final blessing, our St. Michael prayer and our final hymn. closing hymn, Blessed Be the Lord.
He will protect me from their wicked hands. Beneath the shadow of his wings I will rejoice to find a dwelling place secure.